Hello and welcome to the Unequal Exchange podcast. I'm Joseph. I'm joined today by Professor Manny Ness. Manny is the chair of the Department of Political Science at uh, CUNY Brooklyn, and he's also a board member of the Argyria Manual Association. Thank you for that introduction, uh, Joseph. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be on your show. And thank you so much for joining. So today we're going to be discussing your new book, Migration as Economic Imperialism. In particular, as we're discussing unequal exchange, I want to focus on those aspects, uh, how this, how migration relates and you develop the analysis of unequal exchange considering the rise of migrant labor. So to begin, can you discuss how the framework of unequal exchange works to explain the rise of migrant labor, the rise of so-called guest workers uh, in the global north, and especially how the remittance system has come to play a role as a form of transfer of value? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, I assume your listeners uh, are familiar with the concept of unequal exchange, but I'll just uh, uh, kind of provide a general uh, overview uh, that um, is rooted uh, in the unequal exchange of trade um, between countries of the global north and the global south. Uh, Argiri Emanuel was highly influential in uh, my writing of this book because his perspective is uh, relevant. And in fact, if you read uh, Unequal Exchange itself, uh, he argues, and I think this is a, a theme throughout his books, he, he argues that uh, the only way to change unequal exchanges for all the population of the global south to move to the global north and to be treated on an equal basis. Um, and, and, you know, obviously that's not something that's going to happen. Um, and But he's also kind of driving home the point that um, the, the unequal exchange is based on imperialism uh, over hundreds of years, and it's rooted in um, the you know Marxian notion of uh, value and um, and trade. So I think that the most important aspect of it is that uh, workers in the global south, uh, everywhere, and um, I, many scholars would argue everywhere in the global south, uh, are not uh, remunerated for the work that they do. Uh, and uh, as a consequence of uh, trade uh, between nations, um, the uh, extraction of surplus value is uh, multiplied to a great extent. And, um, you know, so for instance, this is one reason why migration takes place. Uh, and this might um, be a controversial point with your listeners, but I don't think so. Uh, that I, the, my argument is that even migrant workers who move to the north are better off uh, than anyone in the global south because, you know, for the most part, unless they're being trafficked, uh, that they are, uh, they're, they're, the extraction of surplus value is lower on balance uh, than it is in their countries of origin. So for instance, one can go to the 1990s uh, when there was a, after NAFTA, a major wave of uh, indigenous migrants from Mexico in particular, uh, who came to uh, cities in the Northeast and throughout the country, the Midwest as well. And they um, uh, were indigenous. They did not speak Spanish nor English. Uh, and uh, yet they organized and uh, were able to increase their wages from what was then a dollar an hour to the minimum wage. Um, now, again, of course, they're still exploited, highly exploited. Uh, they weren't able to form a union organization uh, because of the resistance uh, and so forth. Uh, but it shows you that... Um, you know, they were able to provide to some degree remittances to their families, not to a great degree, because uh, in my work, I, I found that remittances uh, is, uh, really do not really amount to much for uh, countries in the global south. 
So Emmanuel's work comes uh, into play significantly uh, in this work. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, chapter one uh, has a, a long uh, discussion of uh, why uh, Emmanuel's work is related to uh, the question of migration, um, which is not something that's insignificant because today, um, we, we have more migrants uh, in absolute numbers than ever before in the world. Uh, you know, I know it's uh, politically correct to say that that's not the case uh, because you know they're not there's not no influence whatsoever. Uh, but I, I, I don't I think that's actually denying a reality that exists uh, and denying uh, the fact that uh, wages are so imbalanced. Um, so, uh, in fact, um, you know, when we go further, uh, that, in, in fact, migrant workers are almost produced by the global south to work in the global north, um, which further extracts um, value through the trade of migrants. Uh, so, for instance, if you think of workers in Ghana who go to Britain, uh, Patrick Coburn uh, writes a, wrote a, a very interesting article about a decade ago uh, about uh, Ghanaian uh, women who became nurses and are were responsible for basically serving the British state. Um, and yet, you know, if you think about uh, Ghana, which is a poor country, and I think they just had to succumb to a uh, structural adjustment program by the IMF, um, they... You know, I mean, th there is an absolute drain in terms of, you know, the training and so forth that they provide uh, that is uh, extracted from uh, the population and the people of Ghana. Uh, and uh, the benefit goes to uh, uh, people in Britain, even if, um, you know, one can say that uh, migrant workers from Ghana, who are working in Britain, make higher wages than they ever would make in, in Ghana. So, uh, I mean, there are many aspects of this book that deal with that question. And to even a greater extent, um, uh, I, I'm raising the, the problem of development. Uh, there really isn't a development model that's valid uh, outside of a uh, a redistribution of income on a global scale, um, you know, degrowth, et cetera, which is a, a very important idea that Chris Hickel has advanced, uh, I think uh, takes us in the right direction, uh, but perhaps not far enough. Um, uh, I, I think uh, that development, I mean, Chris Hickel writes about it too, but many uh, authors have done this uh, you know, since the end of the Second World War, the West has been interested in development, especially the United States, primarily as a, uh, a means to uh, continue the extraction of uh, raw materials, uh, agricultural goods, natural resources from the South, as well as, you know, I mean, that's produced by workers, and there is an absolute surplus uh, value extraction uh, that's far greater than anywhere in the North. So I, 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 I should say that I, I highly embrace uh, Emmanuel's work, uh, and I think it's extremely important for um, those people, and it's growing, uh, who are uh, trying to understand the world economy and uh, become activists to recognize that, um, you know, our welfare state, and this is hard, you know, like what people would say, it's uh, hard Pill to swallow that even uh, social welfare programs are built on the basis of that extraction uh, of surplus value. Like I said, it's a bitter pill because uh, if you think about Western Marxism, uh, and um, which you know we've all been trained in uh, over the years. Uh, Drill down that you know you've got to have a robust social welfare state, but uh, in large measure that's uh, made possible through extraction uh, and, and the terms of trade that allow for um, the accumulation of wealth in the global north. Um, yeah, so that's 
uh, but I'd say that uh, Emmanuel is a great influence on my work and will continue to be. Uh, and I'm looking forward to working with you uh, in the uh, Argiri Emanuel Association. Absolutely. And I think continuing that work and, and continuing to build on his ideas. When I read Unequal Exchange recently, you know, he has a lot of small footnotes or little details that you could absolutely uh, expand upon and, and relate to questions around migration, questions around colonialism, settler colonialism that are, and a lot of his later writing about settlerism is very interesting to connect that. Particularly when, as we're discussing a theme of, of your work is looking at the creation of uh, divisions between sets within the working class. That's of course something Emmanuel looks at at a global level. Um, you were just mentioning, you know, your own experience of working within uh, organizing amongst migrant worker communities. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that, how you have a, an excellent line I'd like to read from an interview you did on antiimperialist.net, where you say, um, most workers from the global periphery cannot enter and stay in the global north permanently, but are depicted as temporary or illegal in most of Western Europe and other rich states and economic hubs. They're under a relentless threat of arrest, imprisonment, and deportation. Yet paradoxically, temporary and undocumented migrant workers are essential for accruing surplus profits. In their absence, capitalist profitability would be reduced and the working class in the north could not maintain their high standard of living central feature of the depravity of 21st century economic imperialism. So I'd love to break that down a little bit and how the presence of migrant workers plays this two-sided role within uh, the developed capitalism of the North. Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, I, I have worked, uh, I mean, I've always been interested in uh, the question of uh, social class and uh, particularly uh, poverty and, uh, you know, uh, there's a propensity for Westerners to think of poverty as a Western issue and not a global issue or a issue, local issue and so forth. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's the, the fact of the matter is that uh, uh, the notion and concept of unequal exchange is right in front of our noses and we miss it completely. Uh, and uh, in so many different contexts. I'd like to say, you know, I've done a lot of organizing uh, amongst migrant workers uh, here in the United States, but all throughout the world in some contexts. Uh, most recently, actually, in South Africa. Uh, and uh, there's also an unequal exchange there as well. Uh, you know, uh, but we won't get into that right now. But to answer your question, um, uh, perhaps uh, the best example would be during the COVID-19 crisis between uh, from 2020 to 2022, three-year period, that um, uh, the essential workers uh, that uh, provided uh, uh, services uh, on the platform economy, but also provided essential work for public uh, services in terms of being in hospitals, uh, ensuring that um, uh, people uh, were would not starve in their homes and so forth uh, because they didn't have access to food, uh, working uh, in uh, various uh, public uh, facilities uh, on a temporary basis uh, or on an uh, undocumented basis. Uh, most of those workers uh, were migrants, undocumented migrants, and you know, the United States doesn't have temporary migrants to speak of, just a very small share, uh, and some of them are very wealthy, the people from South Asia. But um, uh, so, uh, you know, so here are workers who are essential to stopping the COVID-19 uh, virus uh, from spreading, from caring to... Uh, uh, people who are in crisis, uh, to managing public uh, sanitation facilities, uh, to being the drivers of ambulances, uh, just to give you examples, uh, to delivering food to, uh, you know, working class or middle class uh, uh, 
were uh, Americans in medium and big cities throughout the country, people who didn't want to go to supermarkets and so forth. They're all migrant, I mean, you know, for the most part, at least uh, in the New York region, but also beyond, they're migrant workers uh, of one way, in one way or another. Uh, in the United States, uh, the migrant worker model is one uh, where it's even worse because, uh, like I said a few moments ago, um, the United States doesn't really have a program to allow temporary migration. Uh, and the vast majority of migrants in this country, some 10 to 11 million, are undocumented and subject to arrest, uh, imprisonment, uh, deportation, and Main and possibly death, as you know, on the borders of uh, the United States, the southern border, and uh, those deportations uh, increased dramatically under the Obama administration, which I, I don't really get into in this book, but in other uh, works, uh, and, uh, to over two million people, uh, and you know, people don't know what the fate of uh, that population is, uh, but that notwithstanding, my, migrants continue to. Uh, Cross the border and are continue to uh, uh, be considered as um, taking the jobs of the working class, which is, uh, uh, I mean, you know, just a complete fable. And a lot of politicians play on that uh, to uh, score points and get elected. Uh, Donald Trump did. Uh, I won't say that Biden is necessarily any better uh, to any great extent, except for perhaps the rhetoric that uh, he engages in uh, because he's continued many of the Trump programs and has created new ones to ensure that this process continues. But um, so, uh, you know, I mean, I, one, even I hear uh, from people, I mean, working class people that, uh, you know, they're, they have uh, set up a, a place for undocumented migrants uh, in Floyd Bennett Field, uh, five miles away from where I live. I say, I, oh, and the person didn't use the term undocumented. Uh, uh, it's a term that's sort of verboten in uh, migration studies. Uh, and it has to do with, well, he's the quote unquote illegal, uh, which is offensive and so forth. Uh, and um, so, you know, I mean, these are people who are uh, working class people who are working in restaurants themselves or working as sanitation workers, et cetera, who are saying this kind of stuff, uh, sec you know, secretaries. And uh, so uh, it, it, it really gets a lot of uh, uh, public uh, attention. Uh, and I, I have to make this point because uh, I think it's crucial. There's no such thing as a migration crisis for the West. That that is a you know a fallacy. So whenever you hear the term and it's used over and again by both right and left, uh, oh we have a migration crisis. So from the right hand, from the political right, there's a migration crisis, and subsequently we have to do something about it. We've got to deport them, arrest them, imprison and deport. And then on the left, they'll say, oh we have a migration crisis. We have to do something about it. Well, actually the answer to the question is, no, nothing should be done. And it's not a crisis because, uh, in fact, these workers are going to contribute to um, advancing uh, profitability and accumulation for capitalists. And also, uh, you know, they, many of them work for workers uh, in construction industry. Uh, many of them work for farmers in agriculture. Uh, and increasingly in manufacturing, uh, and certainly women uh, uh, in care industries, but women also are working in factories and so forth. So, um, uh, and I mentioned uh, before the platform economy, gig, gig workers who deliver uh, ride hailing and all that other stuff, uh, you know, many of them are put into uh, lifetime debt as a consequence of the uh, really oppressive, exploitative terms that fleet owners have, uh, rental agreements to buy a car that by the time they're finished with it, it's no good, or uh, insurance. So you find frequently uh, the person, who, uh, the company that uh, hires uh, low-waged workers 
uh, who are migrants uh, to not only be in charge of uh, hiring them, but uh, also being the owners uh, or related to um, the companies that sell vehicles for, for them and uh, because they, they have to buy these vehicles and uh, insure them. So there's profits that are uh, made uh, hand over fist uh, and they redound to the benefit of uh, you know working class people, but you know certainly upper class people as well in this country. Um, of course, not everybody uses uh, them, but in major cities, they certainly use their services. So um, at the same time, I, you know, I made that point at the very top of the show that those migrant workers, as poorly as they're treated, um, they're far better off than workers, the working class and uh, uh, the precarious laborers in the global south. There's no comparison in terms of their ability to survive. Uh, but so really, uh, just uh, what really got my ire about this is that the World Bank and the IMF and even the United Nations, the International Organization for Migration, which is a unit of it, are promoting this uh, idea that development can take place through migrants sending money back home. Uh, now, we're not talking about just supporting families, which... I can talk about, which I don't think they even do that to any great extent, because after a while, especially in the United States, I mean, we know this is a fact of life. The longer you're away from a person, usually, uh, the less you think about them. And that, so even families don't necessarily benefit, uh, but, you know, certainly the comprador classes, uh, so it's the Marini argument in some respect, uh, they, they make uh, a lot of money. So in a place like El Salvador, um uh the there, there may be uh millions of dollars that go into that country but you really have nobody to provide essential non-tradable services like schooling healthcare housing food and so forth and uh the comprador class in uh, El Salvador has taken over all those services so uh, and have charged uh uh families uh, who collect um uh, uh, a, a smidgen of remittances from back uh, from the United States, usually, uh, you know, uh, they're, they're really living in poverty as well. So, I mean, it, it's really, I think, an imperialist argument uh, to say that um, uh, remittances, which is a huge industry, by the way, it's close to a trillion dollars a year, uh, I mean, that's huge uh, in terms of remittances. Uh, first of all, most of those remittances are from rich countries to other rich countries. Uh, however, most of the migrants are from poor countries to rich countries or from poor countries to less poor countries, like, um, uh, let's say, um, Vietnam to Malaysia or Indonesia to Malaysia, uh, Malaysia being a capitalist hub. Uh, with a lot of uh, natural resources, which exploits its own uh, population of Malayans. The, the indigenous population is exploited by the upper classes there. It's a lot of work been done in that country. Uh, they're essential to the global supply chains, and 80% of the workers in that country, I'm not exaggerating, 80% of the workers are migrant workers who do not have status, uh, have to go back home or uh, end up in uh, undocumentation status. Uh, when I was there last year, uh, uh, I witnessed a number of, I mean, you can see all throughout the city and at the airports, the, the airport in Kuala Lumpur, uh, these buses with bars on them uh, with migrant workers. I actually have a few pictures of them, uh, and I was threatened with arrest for taking those pictures, but I just kept walking. Just I was not going to give that up. But, uh, yeah, I mean, so, uh, I mean, people know, uh, and leaders of these countries know that uh, the exploitation is there, and 
you know, the idea of a temporary migrant worker is also complex because uh, they can easily become undocumented in these third world countries that are you know, kind of like platforms in themselves uh, as part of the global supply chain. You know, so Malaysia produces computer chips, electronics, uh, you know, kind of low end semiconductors and so forth, as well as rubber gloves, which they've been uh, infamous for in terms of treatments of uh, migrant workers. And uh, the migrant workers are highly expendable and uh, usually go home uh, empty handed. Or, uh, you know, there's a lot of literature that uh, was published in the last several years by leading authors like Nicole Piper, amongst others, uh, Matt Withers, that uh, Laura Foley, uh, that, that uh, you know, we've heard about wage theft in the United States. Um, yeah, it's a very important issue, but there is a significant amount of wage theft uh, in the Arab Gulf, in Southeast Asia, in you know, the United States, certainly, uh, in Western Europe, uh, and so forth and so on. Um, uh, by that, I mean is that people were forced to go home uh, because they were no longer uh, needed, and they went home without getting paid, you know, sometimes for over a year. And many of them were, you know, kind of indentured servants. I want to ask you about your reflections in the in the book about the impact of this migration on the development within the periphery. So, you know, your conclusion ultimately is that this that this is its own form of underdevelopment. Uh, it's it's an imperialist strategy for underdevelopment. As you contrast that with the optimism of the the neoliberal perspective that this could be a form of of development by remittance, uh, can you explain a little bit why? I mean, you were alluding to this earlier by even suggesting that migrant workers become sort of a, a commodity that begins to be exported by peripheral countries. Um, what what effect does this have on the countries when they are literally exporting part of their population a, as a commodity? Oh, my God. Uh, it's a devastating effect. I mean, there's been a lot of literature written on the Philippines, uh, which I also visited. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, of course, uh, there's a war going on there uh, against the state. Um, in the Philippines, uh, uh, all young people are trained you know, young working class people are trained for working outside the country for export. In fact, Robin Rodriguez wrote a very good book about a decade ago called uh, um, uh, Migrants for Exporters, something like that. Uh, and uh, in that book, she points out that, you know, here you have a state that is actually organized around exporting uh, migrants. So, for instance, it contributes to a warped form of development. Um, in which uh, not just uh, the Philippines, but that's a good example uh, where where people are only trained for working outside of the country and not inside of the country. So in the case of nursing, that's uh, a really significant issue, but also other healthcare jobs. Uh, uh, women particularly are subjected to uh, training. Uh, you go down to... Uh, go to Manila or other major cities. I've seen it myself. And you can see the training academies uh, uh, that are there for uh, young women, uh, girls and young women to uh, be trained as uh, healthcare workers. Uh, I don't, uh, and don't admit, you know, I, I didn't say girls for no reason at all, because I, I think that many of the migrants from the Philippines and Indonesia, uh, many of them who make their way to North America, Canada especially, uh, but other countries uh, around the world uh, are especially what one would refer to as global cities, uh, are, are young women or girls, as far as I'm concerned. And, and I, I consider, in a certain way, the prime of one's life is when you're young. It's when you're supposed to have, you know, experiences that... Uh, don't involve 
absolute work uh, seven days a week because uh, they have to live in the homes of uh, middle class and working class, even families in places like Hong Kong, Singapore, Kuala Lumpur, uh, Tokyo, and many other cities around London. I mean, just uh, these these major financial hubs in the, in the Arab Gulf, uh, Dubai. Uh, it, I did some work in uh, Hong Kong, and I found that um, one out of every 4.5 families had a migrant domestic worker uh, in the age range of 18 to 25. And many of these migrant workers, this is very interesting, are young women, and they are expendable when they become 25 and go back home and uh, maybe they have uh, a nest egg, but they get paid higher wages than, you know, accountants, lawyers, and so forth, government service workers back uh, in the countries of origin, uh, you know, people who are trained to, and again, that goes back to the work of Emmanuel in terms of uh, the question of trade. Uh, uh, I have, uh, in, you know, a tremendous amount of respect for these young women because they have pride uh, and so forth that uh, is really remarkable to see. And they often uh, have protests against their employers um, in places like Hong Kong, which uh, was prominent uh, about five or six years ago, maybe 10 years ago. Um, yet at the same time, uh, when we think about the amount of money they make uh, there, uh, it's far higher than you know, professionals do in the countries of origin. Um, so uh, we're really talking about trade and, and uh, the valuation of that trade, uh, the valuation of the work that's uh, actually being um, engaged in uh, is diminished. And that, again, it goes to Aguirre Emanuel's work uh, in terms of uh, the unequal exchange. Yeah, and President uh, Joko Widodo of uh, Indonesia, I think he's outgoing president because they served one term, uh, said he was going to um, eliminate or reduce these programs. But under his watch, uh, supposed to be a populist leftist, uh, the number of migrant workers, uh, Indonesians are particularly exploited, uh, have uh, maybe doubled or tripled. So I, I, I think it's really wrong and disingenuous to say that, the, you know, this is my feeling, that to say that the numbers of migrant workers have de are declining or insignificant. I, I think they're significant. And I think these work migrant workers are important for the global North economies. Um, to say that they're insignificant is really a way to say, well, you know, these right-wing uh, neo-Nazis or... Uh, fascists uh, in, in the West uh, shouldn't really worry about it because they're not taking their jobs. Well, they're not taking their jobs. These are They're, they're working in uh, industries that, uh, in fact, these workers are employing them. Uh, so uh, it, it's just a populist talking point that uh, happens to work uh, uh, in, in the West, actually, and beyond. You see what I'm trying to say? Um, Absolutely, that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so so these liberals and leftists, to some degree, they're saying, "Well, okay, let's let's not talk about it." Uh, but in absolute numbers, it's just I mean, I can provide that I do provide the data in the book. The numbers of migrant workers have increased because of their low wages, and uh, in fact, uh, multinationals would like to see the numbers grow far more. So, but you know, uh, the question about whether they're taking people's jobs is completely uh, false. False one. I'm curious on that how you how you see that the the left in particular has a in the the Western left has a false narrative about this. Um, I think that aspect of the book criticizing the left's lack of correct analysis of migrant workers I, I think is very powerful 
Um, if you could talk a little bit more about why there's such a lack of understanding of this amongst the Western left. Uh, yes. Uh, well, I think the Western left has completely ignored the effect of migration on countries of origin. Uh, so I look at countries of origin and countries of destination. And destination countries are always far more wealthy, even in the South, uh, in places like uh, the Gulf Cooperation Council, the Arab Gulf, or I mentioned Malaysia and a few other places. Uh, Korea, which is also a beneficiary of migration uh, significantly, which I know well, uh, also benefits from it. Um, but, uh, you know, so, you know, the argument amongst uh, many liberal uh, academics, policy analysts, and so forth, is that um, uh, the numbers should, uh, you know, it should grow. And uh, this is a, I mean, some go as far as saying that, well, I, they're not really, the liberals uh, go as far as saying is that it's really great that these migrants are having these experiences in places like the United States, Britain, uh, France, you know, Germany, et cetera, countries where, you know, you have the AFD, uh, you have um, uh, the British, uh, U the UKIP parties, and you have Donald Trump in the United States and his supporters, that uh, what they'll do is they'll bring home democracy. And uh, so rather than giving money directly to the states who are authoritarian, uh, through foreign loans or assistance in various ways, which actually put them into huge debt. Uh, well, you know, the, you're giving money directly to migrants, and you know they may even overthrow the governments that they come from. And this is a form of democracy. But you know, when you think about it uh, for just one moment, I mean, it's it's a complete fallacy. It's based on a neoliberal free market. Uh, notion that, in fact, these migrant workers who are impoverished for the most part are purveyors of democracy by virtue of living in repressive conditions in the West or other places in the South, uh, like the Arab Gulf, uh, unable to leave their homes, uh, having their passports uh, uh, taken away by uh, their bosses, you know, their families and so forth, uh, and not just families, but bosses. Uh, I don't consider that democratic. Uh, I don't consider that actually humane. But uh, I believe it or not, there's literature on this subject, and uh, especially in political science, there's uh, growing literature about uh, democracy promotion. Uh, in addition to that, uh, many say, well, uh, you know, uh, the, that many of the ideas and the cultures of the West um, get uh, intermixed with uh, the cultures of uh, the global South or the, the global North, the cultures uh, which are better. Uh, it's, it's actually a uh, highly uh, disturbing argument. Uh, and these are by uh, liberal and left academics. Primarily, um, I, I could even mention their names. Peggy Levitt would be one of them. Very well-known uh, uh, professor. Uh, I think Ivy League professor at Harvard, maybe. Uh, she, you know, puts forward this whole idea of, you know, isn't it great that um, uh, people from the Dominican Republic uh, can bring back American ideas of democracy, uh, American ideas of uh, culture. Uh, uh, so it's imperialist in many different ways. Uh, Western Marxists uh, also uh, engage in this kind of uh, diatribe um, through uh, uh, essentially, you know, I, I believe that migrants should be protected absolutely and in every context. Uh, how, however much they're making, they should be protected and that there is a tremendous amount of xenophobia that we have uh, in the West uh, and so forth, and it's growing, and it's very serious. But to, to make uh, the argument that um, migrant workers uh, uh, should uh, come to the United States uh, to learn democracy, to participate actively in the society, 
is a way of also extracting the the most um, skilled. Uh, you know, people used to call it the brain drain. I still would. Uh, uh, that's that concept is about 30, 40 years old or more, maybe fifty. Uh, that um, you know, people have no conception that, in fact, uh, uh, you know, if you think about the work of uh, of Lenin. Uh, his his last works are focused on the the necessity to have uh, skilled administrators of this of a socialist state, an actually existing socialist state. I mean, he was very practical, and you know, if you read his last works, he makes that that argument that uh, I think in one step forward and two steps backward, it may have been his last piece. Uh, he he argues that we 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 need a disciplined cadre, sorry, um, uh, evoking your show, uh, we need a disciplined cadre to manage our society. And I, I agree, but Western Marxists would, you know, I mean, they, uh, at any era of the Soviet Union, especially between 1917, 1918 and 1956, they're opposed to, uh, but even to the very end. And of course, that's the same kind of, uh, Nonsense that they uh, say toward, uh, I mean, argue about China as well, that, um, you know, uh, I, I'm interested in the idea. I think there's a resurgence of interest in actually existing socialism uh, because we live in a real world that's not, you know, based on idealism and so forth. But I also think that those ideal, those non-idealists should focus on the third world where the, uh, the truly oppressed uh, as you know, as Fanon uh, and others would uh, put it, uh, live and work and uh, and suffer. I could expand on this if you'd like. But... Yeah, I, go for it. Well, Ali Kadri, uh, who's a comrade, uh, who you may know, uh, a scholar of the Middle East, uh, uh, who has had experiences and written on the Palestine question. Um, uh, makes the case that um, uh, sending migrant workers abroad is a very bad idea because it, uh, the first of all, the those people who are most skilled, and it goes back to a Leninist argument, Marxist-Leninist argument, if I may, uh, that uh, they leave the country. Uh, and uh, then they come back and they become rentiers themselves. Uh, you know, because, you know, they're, they're using that the exchange value that they were able to uh, extract, which is a very small amount, to become petty landlords. Uh, maybe they'll own a plot of land or something like that. So uh, Ali Kadri in, Kadri in his book, he says, well, you know, this is taking away, and I, I, I cite him, that this is taking away from the possibility of uh, socialist revolution because uh, you really do need a rural uh, uh proletariat uh, to advance uh, revolutions in global South countries, third world countries. And, um, you know, so this does not do that. It actually draws people away from the land, uh, uh, which is a source of security economically and also, uh, I would say, class struggle and uh, national liberation. Um, so anyway, I, I think... Uh, Ali Khadri's work is very important in that context, and his book on Palestine and migration uh, is uh, um, a very important contribution to the work on migration. He, incidentally, has just published a new book uh, on capitalism as waste, which uh, I also strongly recommend that it wastes people away, especially you know, he's concerned with people from the global south. Uh, and Excellent. I, uh, go ahead. Yeah. No, I'd, well, I'd love to discuss that more. I, I'd, I'd love to invite Ali to do an interview as well. Um, I can ask him yeah, for you. That would be fantastic. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask yeah, a little. Great sense of humor. So. Yeah, that that'd be great. Yeah, just to just to chat to him. Um, yeah. I wanted to ask a little bit more to focus on one, as we've been discussing one of these exemplary systems that sort of depicts all of these attributes at once, which is the kafala system in 
uh, in the Gulf countries. So when we were talking about the feminization of migrant labor, for example, this this is a great uh, example of that. I wonder if you could explain a little bit about the kafala system and how it works. Um, I think people are familiar through the building of the the FIFA World Cup stadium a little bit, but exactly how that matches exactly what you're describing here. Yeah, uh, the kafala system is uh, used uh, in the Arab, very rich Arab Gulf states. Uh, they're rich in some ways and not rich in others. You know, Saudi Arabia probably has a large, uh, it does have a large working class. And, but not, notwithstanding, um, uh, those people who can afford to have migrants uh, expropriate uh, those migrants' passports, uh, have full domination and control over them, do not allow them, and primarily women, to leave the home. So again, it's a patriarchal form of uh, exploitation of women. Um, women do not have access to necessary services. They're cut off from their families. Um, they are subject to physical abuse and other kinds of uh, uh, horrors, one would say. Uh, and um, you know, during the most recent, like I said, COVID, uh, many of them were just sent home uh, with a penniless, without being paid. Uh, because, you know, in the Gulf region, there's also economic recessions that, that happen from time to time. And um, uh, But, you know, in, in that region also, every family has their, even more so than Hong Kong and places like that, Every virtually every family has a migrant laborer working for them. Because, you know, if you think about the population of the UAE or Qatar, uh, about 90 percent, 80 to 90 percent of all the population uh, are migrants and about 10 to 15 percent are citizens. And those migrants could never gain any kind of status there and never will unless they're highly skilled, uh, you know, Programmers who make five hundred thousand dollars a year, but no, yeah, they, they're forced back. Uh, but, and, and women are particularly subject to this form of exploitation. I think a lot of people think, you know, there's this notion that migrants are men. Uh, that used to be the case, but it isn't any longer. Um, the numbers most recently show that uh, it's about fifty-fifty division, fifty-two to forty-eight. Uh, 52% male, 48% women, but I'm sure women are undercounted. But that's the data. So I think we should go by the data, 52 to 48, so an equal number, uh, roughly. And uh, uh, women are not only working in the homes uh, uh, of uh, not just in the Gulf, uh, but other places, uh, but they're also working in factories. Uh, they're, they're working, you know, obviously in the, the kind of, Feminize, feminized jobs of care work and so forth, but also as agricultural workers, construction workers, as well as manufacturing workers and platform workers. You know, I mean, uh, I've done a lot of uh, participant observation and uh, research, uh, and um, I'm working on a project right now, just an article. Uh, that includes uh, Qatar as a place of extreme uh, extreme exploitation of, of uh, migrant women, chiefly from South Asia and Southeast Asia, to places like Indonesia, maybe Pakistan, and also Africa, uh, increasingly, um, who basically have no mobility whatsoever. So it's a far worse uh, place to work, as bad as places like uh, Hong Kong might be, uh, and, you know, you don't even know if you're going to get paid. You don't have access really to the embassy. Of course, things are changing or there's some movements and so forth. Uh, one of the critical questions that I see on a global basis is, um, I raised it the other day, is where are the unions? Uh, many of these countries don't have unions. Uh, uh, I mean, think about a place like Thailand. Uh it's it's the center of the international labor organization in Southeast Asia, uh, in Bangkok. There, there there are really no unions there. I mean, there are 
on paper, but if you try to go to their office, they don't, they're not there. And yet, uh, Thailand is the recipient of Burmese migrants, uh, who are come and go as, uh, and are deported uh, on a regular basis uh, as, as needed, you know? So, I mean, to call this a system, you know, I, you know, using Friedrich Hayek and all these other scholars, uh, uh, of neoliberalism, uh, the modern day equivalents are calling this a form of development um, because, uh, and, and also uh, the highest level of democracy uh, because everybody has uh, the right to be a business person for themselves. Uh, the money doesn't go to a state, the money goes to individuals. Of course, you know, there may be a couple of exceptions in Morocco, say, where you know, they might have been able to build a, a facility, but that's just the exception uh, to, the, to the general rule of uh, extreme exploitation um, of the migrants uh, and absolute uh, disregard for the people back home. And, I, and that's where the uh, Western Marxists and liberals uh, uh, don't really under, they don't really understand that concept. Uh, you know, these... There is a reason for people to develop their own country. Uh, I would say, you know, hopefully in a uh, means that uh, develop strong states uh, that can move towards socialism, uh, uh, what some people call uh, multipolarity or polypolarity. Uh, which is necessary, as you know, in places like Southern Africa, uh, where you have Malawians who are destitute and, and many others from surrounding countries, including people in South Africa uh, who live in different parts of the state. Uh, the country is still today uh, the most unequal in the world, as you probably know. I looked up the statistics about a week ago just to confirm. So, you know, uh, I mean, I just want to, so I, I think just to kind of get to the gravamen of the kafala system, uh, highly exploitative, uh, marginal changes are being made, but they're not really implemented. COVID really set that back. Uh, then on the point of Western Marxists and uh, liberals, there is this idea or idealization of the migrant as uh somebody who's going to permanently stay in the country, which, you know, I, I support if the person wants to stay, you know, but uh, ultimately it, it creates uh, greater levels of inequality on a global basis. So, uh, you know, they, they don't see the forest for the tree, as we used to say back in the day. That's absolutely right. Um, I wanted to move with sort of my last question to uh, your conclusion and the discussion of the practical role of organizing with migrant workers uh, and what anti-imperialist activists should do to organize amongst and with uh, migrant workers. One conclusion that you have, which I think is particularly important, is that migrant workers serve almost as sort of a conduit of information about the super exploitation and conditions within within the periphery and that that is a way to inform uh, and continue to radically link struggle to the global south. I wonder if you could provide some ideas for those who are committed to anti-imperialism of how these connections should be forged. Yeah, I, I think uh, anti-imperialists in the uh, global north uh, uh, have a very significant role to play in advancing uh, the struggle uh, for socialism on a global basis, but particularly in the global south, uh, and also for uh, advancing um, the conditions of countries uh, of origin, which is what my primary uh, concern would be. Uh, and I think it should be all of our concern. Uh, we're talking about 80% of the planet uh, population and so forth. Uh, that and we're you know so for instance migrant workers in the U.S. or Western Europe, uh, East Asia, etc. 
most of them are highly exploited workers. And most of them, you know, contrary to this liberal argument that they learn democracy, which is just uh, bullshit, if I may say, uh, because they, le they learn exploitation. They learn about the situation. Uh, I think it's very important to work with them closely, uh, help organize them uh, to uh, advance struggles back in their home countries. Uh, uh, it, I'm not saying overthrow governments or anything like that, but, uh, oh, yeah, I mean, in some contexts, that might be a, a good idea. Uh, but, um, you know, so, for instance, let's say in the context of Niger, there are a lot of migrants from Niger in the United States. Uh, so maybe they brought back uh, the notion of the horrors that uh, uh, await migrants uh, to people back home. Uh, you know, people who go to France, people who go to the United States uh, or other parts of the world, uh, you know, they're they're. They, they, they become uh, uh, black in the West, uh, as opposed to being Nigerian or being uh, uh, a Burkina or or, or being uh, Ghanaian and, or Malian. They 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 are treated as a you know blanket group, uh, as bad as African Americans or worse. Uh, I would say worse in so many cases. So I mean, it's a racial struggle uh, because. Uh, the world is divided, uh, and uh, there's a racial component to it. I, of course, I'm not interested in, uh, you know, identity politics and so forth. But we can't, we can't miss that. That's absolutely, you know, Africa, uh, Asia. Most of the people who migrate are, are you know, certainly less privileged and uh, 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 racial minorities, especially once they reach their destinations. I mean, the idea that they're actually learning democracy is just bizarre. So we as uh, anti-imperialists, uh, you know, must work within those organizations to inculcate uh, and to support their ideas that um, the, the real problem is inequity because they actually know it. I mean, it's kind of like uh, the, the problem uh, of most Westerners is that they go to places like South Africa, uh, and they uh, may be Marxists, whatever they are, uh, and they inculcate ideas that most of the people don't even agree with, uh, you know, Western Marxists. Uh, I mean, you know, I mean, most black South Africans don't agree with uh, Western Marxism at all. Uh, that's true of uh, South Asians, so, you know, of, uh, people from Southeast Asia, et cetera, they're, they're opponents. I mean, they may, people back home should learn not to idealize the West, uh, but also recognize, I mean, you know, provide, I actually wrote this in a, a Chinese journal, uh, International Critical Thought, um, that uh, the idealization of the Western model is one of exploitation and one that only uh, is uh, is one that's based on protecting and advancing accumulation of uh, Western and Northern capitalists. And uh, there, there is no intention whatsoever of sharing that wealth. And we see that on a regular basis. So, you know, in places like India and so forth, there are Marxist-Leninist parties, uh, you can say that here, right, uh, that are very strong and robust, uh, that uh, are, uh, you know, they, they have the uh, a course pack <laughs> of readings, you know, starting with Marx uh, and the manifesto, Marx and Lenin, uh, capital uh, angles on um, utopianism, uh, uh, you know, Lenin, uh, what is to be done, etc. I mean, those are the kinds of things that we should be educating uh, migrants here, uh, and I, I, I think that's something that is very important because they, uh, the one thing that we could transmit is socialism, uh, rather than a uh, highly flawed system of so-called or self-proclaimed democracy. Uh, 
that is for the few, as Michael Parenti pointed out. Uh, so yeah, I, I would say that that's the most important thing. And some people do that. I mean, we do have these things called or these organizations called worker centers. I don't think they're adequate. I don't think they do that at all. And so um, there's a need to create new models for anti-imperialists to transmit these ideas um, amongst workers. And I think they, they would have a lot of uh, purchase amongst uh, migrants who are working in precarious jobs in the West. And so, I, so I, I'm not a uh, pessimist, I'm an optimist. And uh, I think things will only get better uh, in the future. So uh, people should really uh, take up this challenge and uh, fight against imperialism, but also work with uh, migrants and migrant organizations, not in an imperialist way to convey ideas of Western cultural hegemony, but to incul inculcate the idea of power that they have to resist. Uh, right. So, you know, we're not the conveyor belts of uh, cultural I ideas, but we support them in advancing their interests, yeah. uh, their national interests and their lower, their class interests. Because mm. most of the third world, as you well know, uh, is most of it, but not all of it, is dominated by comprador classes. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you so much, Manny. This this was a great discussion, and um, I I think everyone should read the book. Uh, we hope to continue the discussion with further events and 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 letting people know about this text because it's a very important advancement, I would say, of of unequal exchange theory and Emmanuel's work and putting it into the 21st century context. So, yeah, and um, if people have further questions or thoughts, uh, and there can be more discussion on this, but I think it's a great uh, it's a great book and helps really put this conversation at the forefront of people's minds politically. Yeah, I'd also like to, you know, give you a plug. You're, you're going to uh, be in New York at the People's Forum, I believe, on September 14th to talk about the problem of dependency yeah. and Marini's work uh, in a direct way. Uh, so I urge people to attend uh, the People's Forum on the 14th, I believe. I think it starts yep. at 7. That's right, uh, yeah. And if people want to reach me, uh, you know, I get back to people uh, almost, well, within 24 hours, uh, sometimes even when I'm in a plane, they're not. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, I uh, my email is manny m a n n y dot ness n e s s at gmail dot com. Excellent. Thanks so much, Manny. Uh, take care. Have a great okay. rest of your day. You know, you're one of the leaders in the struggle, so we need you. Thanks. I really appreciate it, and thanks for having this chat. And uh, hopefully, we can catch up um, before you go to South Africa. I wanted to let you know that. Um, yeah, as we were having this conversation, it's helping me think through the research I want to do there with South, in the South African context, especially. This is very relevant. They need you. Yeah. Uh, right. I mean, they really need you. I, I don't say that uh, lightly. I mean, there's a need for an alternative uh, to uh, Western Marxism and yeah. so social democracy or whatever you want to call it. Right. Yeah. 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 So anyway, thanks. And uh I, I uh, look forward to good news in October. Definitely, yeah. All right, take care, Manny. Talk to you later. Sure. Bye. Bye.